Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session titled Uplifting Indigenous Community Wisdom, Skookum Lab's Journey in Indigenous Social Innovation. This is the first webinar in our six part uh, online learning and discussion series taking place this winter and spring 2021 on decolonizing community based research hosted by Community Based Research Canada. My name is Julia Coburn and I'll be the uh, moderator for today's session. I'm also the CBR Canada program coordinator. So first, before we get started, I wanted to share a, a territorial acknowledgement and respectfully acknowledge that CBR Canada, the Secretariat, is situated on traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. In the spirit of reconciliation, CBR Canada is committed to engaging with and learning from the diverse Indigenous peoples and communities across Canada, as well as addressing the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action. And I have up here, um, for anybody's interest, obviously, the first call to action, which it, it uh, seemed quite relevant for this conversation about uh, focus on children and youth. So a little bit about Community-Based Research Canada. Our mission is to advance community-based research excellence in Canada by strengthening partnerships, bridging capacity, mobilizing knowledge, and championing CBR among individuals, communities, and institutions. For 10 years, CBR Canada has brought together key players of community campus partnerships. So really this is about um, all of you. So we'll, um, we'll be hearing an amazing presentation. And but please, uh, as the presentation is going on, leave your questions and comments in the chat box and we'll bring them up in the last 10 to 15 minutes of this webinar. And also to let everybody know this webinar is being recorded and you can later find within the next, uh, maybe early next week, it will be available on our website on communityresearchcanada.ca slash learning together. And, uh, before, without further ado, I'm really pleased to welcome our wonderful presenters today, Jessica Slater, Ravina Morgan, Melissa Lumberjack, and Crystal Jemay Ziprick, and Megan Rosso from Skookum Labs. So Jessica is a Nihagao Iskwayo Cree woman whose family is from the Ishekwi Sipi Fisher River Cree Nation in Manitoba. Jessica has been working with youth for over eight years. Her work combines traditional teachings and value systems with contemporary art like hip hop, graffiti, and other unique elements to engage young people. Her training includes Aboriginal children and youth care counseling, trauma informed practice and culture as treatment. Jessica is an Indigenous Social Innovation Coordinator for Skookum, one of Turtle Island's first Indigenous led social innovation labs. Uh, Ravina Katie Morgan is Chippewan, Cree, Metis, and South Asian descent. Her traditional name is Amoy Poyesis Esquayu, which translates to hummingbird woman. She was born and raised on the unceded traditional ter shared territories of the Simiamu, Tsawasin, Kwantlen, Katsi, Kayakayat, and Kwetlem people, or what is now known as Surrey, BC. Ravina is a student at Douglas College and is pursuing a degree in child and youth care counseling. Over the past eight years, Ravina has uh, worked in Indigenous nonprofit sector in various capacities. Currently, her work is through Skookum Lab as community engagement facilitator, as well as Scale, scale Up um, Reconciliation in Kairos Canada as a cultural competency facilitator. Um, we also have Melissa Lumberjack, who is an Ojibwe woman from Kiniston so Soto Nation, uh, a small reservation in rural Saskatchewan. She is the second oldest of five children raised by a single mother. Her mother moved uh, the young family from Saskatchewan to the lower mainland when Melissa was 14. Melissa is currently an information management operations officer in Indigenous Services Canada and is the recipient of the 2019 BC Region Circle of Excellence Awards. Prior to ISC, she worked at RBC for 13 years as a client advisor in business banking and was recognized by RBC Regional Management as a top quarterly achiever on four separate occasions. In 2010, she earned a seat at the RBC Cruise Convention. Most recently, she has completed Envision Financial's Community Leaders Igniting Change Program at SFU's Beatty School of Mystis. Melissa is an active uh, Skookum Lab ambassador and is committed to improving the lives of Surrey's Indigenous youth and their families. We also have Crystal Demay Zeeprick, and she is a Plains Cree, Scottish, and of English descent from the Treaty Six Nation of Saskatchewan. 
She's a small business owner in Surrey, BC of Simply Style Mobile Hair Design. She graduated from Surrey College Hairdressing Program, the PICS Best Program, the Chinook Aboriginal Management Program at the Sauter School of Business and Community Leaders Igniting Change Program at the BB School of Business at SFU. She's also the PAC co-president in Quentlin Park Secondary and vice president of the PAC for KV at Woodward Elementary School. Crystal is a Squeakum Lab ambassador and has been part of the Squeakum Lab since its very beginning. And last but not least, we also have Megan Rosso, who is a carrier Sikani, a woman from the Lake Bavin Nation in Northern interior of British Columbia. She comes from the House of the Firekeepers and belongs to the Caribou Plan. She obtained the Bachelor of Arts in Communication Studies with Simon Fraser University. Megan has experience supporting Indigenous communities for over 10 years in a variety of roles. She often utilizes her own array of experiences to engage actively with Indigenous communities that surround her. Megan's previous uh, community support initiatives have exemplified her dedication and commitment to assisting and encouraging her community members. She is currently working as an employment advisor with Aboriginal Community Careers Employment Services Society and as an ambassador with Skookum Labs in Surrey. So an amazing group of, um, of women here we have today and I'm going to let you take the floor and so excited to hear your conversation. Thank you so much. Great. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting us here today. Um, when we heard about this series of decolonizing community-based research, um, it, that sounded so up our alley. So we're pleased to kick this series off. Um, as I was introduced, my name is Jessica Slater. My traditional name is Wapaskepa Squamistosa Squeo, and I am from um, uh, Ochequi CP Cree Nation on my mom's side and on my dad's side I'm English and Scottish and I've been the Indigenous Social Innovation Coordinator for Skookum Lab for a number of years now. Um, so we're going to jump into our presentation to tell you about that. Okay. Okay and then uh, I have my uh, my part, I put my part in there first. <laughs> okay, I just gotta put present, there we go. So welcome to Skookum Lab. Skookum means strong, powerful, and brave, brave in the Chinook trading language here on the West Coast. Um, to us, we really, wanted a name that could highlight the diversity of the communities that we work with, um, while also a word that ties us all together. So why social innovation? Um, you know, Indigenous people have always been systems thinkers um, and social innovation has really allowed us to ask deeply to the community how they want to be engaged and what activities do they want to be engaged in. And <clears throat> we base our plans off of everything that the community says. Um, it's also been a great um, kind of model for us to be able to go out into community when we're talking about tough issues and see how these issues are directly impacting those with lived experiences um, in a safe way. So. When I think about decolonizing research, I think about that safe way of doing um, the research and building those containers for the work to take place in community. And like I said, uh, Indigenous folks have always been social innovators. Um, we've always used systems thinking. We've always uplifted the gifts of our community members. Um, we've always had complex mm -hmm. trade uh, law, like relationships. And um, I think that revitalizing that is really important. So uh, when, I, when I think about our work, I think about we are de we're revitalizing kinship systems because so many people have not only been displaced from their lands in an urban context, but also from their culture, um, which you'll hear a little bit more about today. We're really lucky to have such a deep and meaningful relationship with the land-based nations around us. Um, this was a ceremony we conducted to honor the elders that have been really um, the keepers of a lot of knowledge and wisdom that we've used in our project. Um, and they really are the people that guide us the most. So we wanted to honor them at one of our campfire gatherings, and this is in the Longhouse. 
Um, and yeah, it's really important, I feel like, you know, when we're talking about decolonizing research, even us as Indigenous researchers, we are still guests on this territory. And if we were coming here pre-contact, we would still follow the protocols of where we are going. So in that case, <clears throat> we are instructed by the protocols of the Kwantlen, Katsi, Semiamu people um, when we conduct our work. Um, but that being said, we also have a very diverse urban community. So we want to make space for everyone to feel seen and heard and that their ancestry is going to be honored in this process as well. So these are the Skookum Lab guiding principles. You can see at the bottom, uh, centering indigenous wisdom grounds all of our work. Oh, sorry. There's a big truck gonna go by. <laughs> um, but, you know, we've really, uh, for, for this work, for this uh, presentation, we're really talking about building community and the, you know, learning about what the community-based problem definition is and what the community-based solutions are. So that it's not a top-down approach, um, you know, where you're just applying a solution on a people without engaging with them. Um, all of our prototypes have come from community. And I think that's what has made the work powerful. Sorry, I was just talking on mute there. Um, this, is a, this is a star blanket that we created. You'll hear a little bit more about this in the presentation, but um, this was based on teachings where I'm from. My aunties are all the star blanket makers back home. And we would ask a theme or a question and the community members would come and give their answers and we'd put it all together. Um, and you can do this a number of different ways. Like for, we did it for research, so we asked, what would make Surrey the best place to raise an Indigenous child? And we got over 2,000 responses. Um, and that was really uh, helpful for the beginning of our work. And it also kind of got us out there into the community so that people could recognize us. And we started building those relationships. So at Skookum Lab, uh, we were only supposed to have three prototypes to address Indigenous child and youth poverty. And it really expanded. So I think there's about 11 in total. Um, internally, um, we have the guide groups. So the guide groups have been with us since the beginning. And it's, um, there's five different guide groups, but they guide all of the work. So they are uh, community members with lived experience. Um, we have the ambassador program, which is a Indigenous leadership program um, that all of the participants or all of the panelists today are a part of. Um, we are doing a mini lab on housing solutions because there's a huge lack of housing for the Indigenous community in Surrey. Um, we also are working on, there's no centralized gathering space in Surrey for Indigenous folks. So that has been a real barrier to um, building supportive community networks and um, being able to come together and have visibility as well in the city. We also did a mini lab on, on understanding to action um, race, racism through a social innovation systems lens and that looked at anti-indigenous systemic racism in the Surrey area um, and that report actually led to some policy being implemented on a municipal level so we're really pleased um, that the work is, is starting to move the dials and then we have an, an internal evaluation prototype too um, and you can see here, we have a lot of partnerships. Our partnerships have been so meaningful to the work and have really deepened the work at Skookum Lab. And um, I think that's really a part of, you know, when we're looking at decolonizing research, not only are we revitalizing kinship within our, our personal systems, but also on a systems level, um, this like interorganizational kinship and like what do what does healthy working relationships look like that are based in reciprocity um, and mutual aid. So we have six guide groups now. Métis um, folks make out make up about forty two percent of the population in Surrey of all the indigenous people. Um, we have elders, youth, caregivers. Um, Kikino housing is a housing. Um, place out here. 
with a high concentration uh, and support workers. So um, today we're going to have some members from our guide groups talk about their experiences um, being a guide group member in Skookum Lab. Uh, so you can hear directly from community what has worked well. So thank you. Um, Anine, my name is Melissa Lumbo-Jack and I will be kicking us off. Um, um, okay, so uh, good morning, uh, Anine. I joined Skookum Lab in April 2019. I attended a mural workshop and the theme was help better understand and build solutions to Indigenous child poverty in Surrey. That was a mouthful. But even more amazing is that this was the first time I was asked to be a part of our own solutions. It was very new, it was comfortable, and I felt empowered, but most importantly, it was a safe space to be heard. Uh, next slide, please. I'd like to start with why I was so drawn to Skookum Lab. Growing up in Saskatchewan, I was fortunate enough to have traditional grandparents. We always had wild meat in the freezer and canned berries in the crawl space. Pequazigan, or Bannock, was also baked and through the summer we would drive hours to attend powwows and ceremonies. Before social media, all invites were through the moccasin telegraph, or word of mouth. Somehow everyone would come together in a quiet field out in the middle of nowhere for a few days of stories, prayers, and sharing. At least that was my perception as a child. I remember going to feasts and giveaways with my grandparents. Feast food was prayed over, never to be wasted, and families would bring items to give away to other families in the circle. If you were gifted something, a blanket or gently used clothes that no longer fit their child, a thank you song was sung and on the upbeat, you would hold up your gifts and thanks. As a small shy child, it was scary. And I remember I cried dancing and the old ladies would smile at my grandma and giggle at me. Along with these happy memories, my family, like many indigenous families, also have stories of trauma and hurt that seem to walk hand in hand. My mom, a single parent, moved her five children to Vancouver seeking a better life for us. I was 14. I didn't realize the loss of culture at that time. I was navigating a new world needing connection. I remember attending the Mother's Day powwow at Trout Lake and feeling such a strong sense of belonging. Fast forward a few years when I had my own daughter. By then I realized how important it would be for me to instill our culture in her, still living thousands of miles away from our home. I want her to grow up with a sense of pride in who she is. Like many urban Indigenous families in Surrey, we are all seeking a better life for our children when, <clears throat> excuse me, while holding space for our culture. Skookum Lab was a beacon of light at a time in my life when I needed them the most. Through programs that offer connection above all else, it's been an amazing journey of friendship, laughter, and caring. As a member of Skookum Lab Caregiver Guide Group, my daughter and I have had opportunities we used to dream about. We've attended the ribbon skirt making workshop and enjoyed the beating group nights. Sorry, the beating group uh, nights, especially through COVID. Uh, next slide, please. Through learning cultural teachings from indigenous mentors, caregivers expressed the gratitude. As a result of being a part of the lab, they felt more connected to their culture and were able to pass down cultural practices to their children and experiences that they identified as missing because urban indigenous peoples feel displaced, disconnected, and experience barriers connected to their land-based nations and cultural communities in Surrey. Uh, I'm truly grateful to be a part of this amazing group of people. Miigwech. And I'll, at this time, I'll pass the feather to Rabina. So cultural community, in this section, there are two main points that I'm going to speak on. Next slide, please. The first is about how Skookum Lab engages with Indigenous people living in Surrey. They engage through cultural learning and sharing. Skookum Lab has been hosting cultural community engagements through workshops and gatherings such as bead nights. Prior to the pandemic, Skookum Lab would host bi-weekly intergenerational bead nights for the community which would include dinner, supplies, and support. From those nights, we saw the community create incredible art, regalia, and some beautiful family heirloom pieces. However, since the pandemic, we've had to adapt. We have since moved all of our bead nights online 
and we are now meeting two times per week. Next slide, please. Community members continue to express that, quote, learning new techniques, meeting new people, seeing people start beating, and the feelings of coming alive by being creative is the best part of their week. Next slide, please. As we often say, beating is medicine, and these nights have truly grounded many of us during such a collectively uncertain period of time. This is a photo of some earrings that were inspired by the medicine that we use and the beadwork that we've created together during Skookum Lab beading nights. Next slide, please. Additionally, participants have expressed their gratitude for having accessible options for activities during the week, as caregivers have said that they would prefer their families continue to be engaging with their culture. A quote from a caregiver. One of the things that my daughter quite likes is beating. For me, that's one of the things that Skookum Lab has provided for me in regards to family, that I get to enjoy watching her create, be artistic, create beading projects, and do crafts. The other day, they were coloring the Skookum Lab contest sheets of what makes a house a home. I think for me, that's what Skookum Lab helps with. They provide opportunities to be together and engage in cultural activities rather than be doing something else like watching TV, end quote. Next slide, please. One of the things that I think makes Beating Night so special is the intergenerational cultural mentorship that happens naturally from the elders and knowledge keepers to the caregivers and youth. One of the participants said, quote, learning from really strong Indigenous women. It's just a blessing coming into the program. It kind of gave me more of a personal connection to my own cultural responsibility and handing that down to the children, end quote. We have seen the community really come together to learn, reclaim, and practice cultural ways and protocols. And it's really beautiful to witness because sometimes it's the younger ones who are doing the cultural learning and then they go back to their families and share it with their parents and grandparents. And that is incredibly powerful. Next slide, please. The second point that I want to speak about today is one of our highlighted engagements, our ribbon skirt workshop. Participants of this workshop share deeply about their experience with making ribbon skirts for themselves and for their children as a part of their regalia. From this workshop, they describe their feelings as being uplifted and feeling pride in their Indigenous identities. Next slide, please. One participant said, quote, I was able to make my daughter regalia. That was such a distant goal and I wasn't sure if that would ever happen. I myself, unfortunately, was not able to attend the workshop, but I was grateful for the friends that I've made through Skookum Lab who passed on the teachings to me so that I too can make a ribbon skirt. And so now I would like to ask two of these friends who are here, Crystal and Megan, to share their stories and experiences from the Ribbon Skirt Workshop and how it's impacted their families. And say, after taking the Ribbon Skirt Workshop, I went home and made my daughter a ribbon skirt to match mine. I made her friend one for when they do their drumming at school. And we wore them during, uh, we wore matching skirts while drumming and marching in the Women's March in Vancouver. And that was such a proud moment for me. I also made one to add to her regalia, which I'm now learning to make thanks to um, Melissa and the beading groups that, um, that, I've, that I've been joining since joining Skookum Lab. Next slide, please. Megan. Thank you, Crystal. Um, so my mom was in residential school as early as five years old. So she raised me without my language and culture as a protective mechanism. So having the opportunity to make a ribbon skirt for my daughter was a lifetime memory for us both. My daughter had a chance to, de to develop pride in being Indigenous through connecting with the community and the culture with Skookum Lab. Additionally, I was able to go backwards and teach my mom how to make a ribbon skirt, which was huge. Marcy Cho, Crystal, and Megan for sharing. To summarize, the cultural community in Surrey has grown, is growing, and is strong. Our goal is to continue to create culturally relevant and consistent engagements for Surrey's Indigenous community. Next slide, please. I would like to finish with one last quote from a community member. For us, we don't have a lot of cultural community here. We don't really have much of community community of any sort here. 
Having Skookum Lab, where we could go on a regular basis, interact with the same people with similar cultural backgrounds, that was helpful for our family. My partner and I tried to find and engage the kids in cultural opportunities wherever we can. My goal is that they are proud to be Indigenous. All my relations. Since joining the Skookum Lab Caregiver Guide Group, I have made some amazing connections to Indigenous family and friends. Next slide, please. Um, in Surrey, there is a large Indigenous population in the suburbs. Skookum Lab found that, program, that there is a surprising lack of connection within our area. There is a lack of cultural programs and no central gathering spaces. One of the quotes from a guide group member was, we have the largest population of Indigenous people in all of the suburbs of Vancouver, but you don't see anybody. There's no central gathering space. Um, there's no central gathering space. There's, you don't see or anything like that. You really don't know who's all out there. Next slide, please. First time I heard of Skookum Lab was the Guiding Youth Home Gala and Sarah and Jessica were set up in the corner with a whiteboard and a bunch of cutouts and star blanket shapes. Asking the questions, if you could do one thing to address Indigenous child and youth poverty in Surrey, what would you do? I thought this was such an amazing way to involve the community. Then I saw them again getting the children involved at the rec center at a pop-up powwow asking the same question. And I thought, what a, what a fun way of getting the kids involved. And then I was hired at the Indigenous Peoples Day Festival in Holland Park. And we asked the same question to the community. And the responses were so good. Feedback from people living in the community. Um, and a lot of their responses were housing, resources, and cultural connection based. Next slide, please. Um, my family lives my family lives in Saskatchewan on the Treaty 6 Nation and I was moved here as a baby and I grew up on the west coast with my mom and sister. I never really had connection to culture until I moved to Surrey 12 years ago. Since Gookum Lab started the caregiver guide group um, groups, we're very grateful to be a part of this group. My family and I have made some amazing friends through bead nights, workshops, and ambassador work. It feels like we have a family here. We will always have people to turn to, elders, friends, and cultural teachings. We look forward to Ravina's bead nights and beading with elders and families. For example, I became friends with Melissa throughout our Skookum journey, and she has taught me so much about powwows and regalia. My daughter always danced without regalia, and I felt guilty because of that. But now I can proudly make her and add to her regalia with love. And I'm grateful to Skookum Lab for these connections. Um, next slide, please. I also enjoy when we eat and craft together with the Skookum community. And as ambassadors, we're working together to help Swilsey and Skookum Lab with their work to reduce child and youth poverty. They hire Indigenous people in the community, in the Surrey community, that all have had experience with poverty or struggled somewhere along on our journeys that we can share and feel that connection to help in ways that Skookum Lab has come up with to reach their goals to make Surrey a great place for Indigenous children and youth. I'm happy to be able to pass on culture to my children because I didn't have that growing up and that, that feels pretty amazing. Thank you. One of the most attractive attributes of working with Skookum Lab was getting to participate in conversations about indigenous issues with indigenous people. Next slide. It was a great feeling to gather with like-minded and experienced individuals around beating circles or talking circles and discuss how systemic racism was impacting our families and children today. The discussions were so inclusive of everyone's experiences and focus, focused on practical solutions for the community. I understand the importance of learning and teaching history and how contact has impacted our lives today, but I was very happy and ready to join the discussion of how to address the issues now. Next slide. In the spring of 2020, we gathered in Semiamu territory, also known as White Rock, BC, to participate in a campfire that focused on racism in Surrey. I was very impressed by the organization of the campfires in which Skookum Lab brought various stakeholders together, like the Ministry of Education, Social Development, and Children and Families. These campfires were held on Indigenous territory, developed with local Indigenous protocol, and focused on Indigenous issues. 
These events were so well planned that they left an imprint on everyone that attended. So much so that the staff from the Ministry of Social Development went away with intentions to hire more Indigenous staff to provide better services to the local Indigenous community. These are small changes that will provide a large amount of support for our local community. Additionally, having all of these amazing service workers come together to understand our articulation of the Indigenous experience has offered a lot of insight to the development of action plans and steps to move forward into a more supportive and safe community for our Indigenous youth to grow up in. Next slide. Skookum Lab has rooted its work in community involvement, engagement, and planning. This has been monumental in developing the priorities to address Indigenous child and youth poverty in Surrey. I loved the campfire setup and the process was so insightful. This process allowed us to sort through our experiences and focus our efforts on the systemic racism that exists today. This focus will offer insight to where the Skookum work can continue. Next slide. Last but not least, we will articulate how Skookum Lab has financially supported our Indigenous community over the last two years. Next slide. Skookum Lab is rooted in culture and one of the cornerstones of Indigenous worldview is reciprocity. The practice of exchanging things with other, others for mutual benefit is the generic definition of reciprocity. But when reciprocity is a cornerstone of how you see the world, you understand that you do not simply pay people for their time. Even though money is the most popular form of offering respect for people's time and knowledge, Skookum Lab has reintroduced the understanding of reciprocity to our local community, exemplifying reciprocity in everything that they do. Feeding families that come out to add to the articulation of Indigenous experiences, providing gas and food cards to elders that come out to offer wisdom and guidance, gifting local nation leaders that offer time, space, and hospitality to our gatherings, Reciprocity, when upheld, reintroduces the understanding of a symbiotic relationship um, of community and connection. It adds to the articulation that everything is connected and every interaction must mutually benefit everyone involved. This is the understanding that stakeholders need to leave our events with so that when the systemic racism work commences, we have allies that fully understand how and why Indigenous communities experience what they do. Next slide. Additionally, Skookum Lab has gone above and beyond in support of the community, supporting financially through the pandemic any and every family that they could. Um, they've offered many types of financial supports. There was gas cards, pizza dinners, and emergency funds offered to those in need. Community was really struggling to pick up the excessive amount of cleaning and personal protection needed to make it through the pandemic of this proportion. Skookum Lab delivered gift cards and entertainment supplies like beating kits during the shutdown to ensure the mental health and well being of our community that had to remain at home. A few friends are here today to share their experiences with this. Um, <clears throat> during the summer, uh, I got some terrible news that my uh, 20 year old nephew's life was taken, and I wasn't working very much at all um, because of COVID. And then I needed to get home to be with my family, and we had to leave pretty quick so we could get there to help my brother um, with the service. My mother and my two kids came with me and I reached out to Jessica and Sarah and told them what had happened. And they had a couple of meetings with Skookum Lab and Swolsey and they were, Skookum Lab was able to help us and gift, um, help us and gift us with gift cards and gas for groceries for our travel. And um, that meant the world to us because we were pretty upset. Our funds were low and we just really wanted to get there as soon as we could. Um, it meant the world to us to be there and be able to be there for my brother and my family during that time. So I'm always thankful. Thank you for sharing, Crystal. Uh, yes, Skookum Lab has helped Indigenous families in crisis. They have also provided support in other ways. As mentioned, prior to COVID, gift cards were offered while attending various events. To many, that might seem like a small gesture, but to our community, they were often seen as relief because many, <clears throat> excuse me, because maybe that week getting much needed groceries was less of an issue. Uh, young Indigenous children have also had opportunities offered to them. Recently, my daughter Leah, Crystal's daughter Tegan, Ravina's son Kai, among others, were offered the opportunity to share in their own words a short video explanation of their contest submissions. What makes a house a home? 
All were articulate, very adorable, but most importantly, they understood their words and their thoughts matter. Each participant received a small honorarium, and speaking of my own daughter's appreciation, watching her earn her own gift card was an awesome experience. Um, I was able to see the joy in her little face, and it was priceless. Um, additionally, the contest was widely distributed through Kikino Native Housing, and two little boys who might not have been encouraged to enter were included and both won prizes. Skookum Lab Ambassadors, excuse me, Skookum Lab Ambassadors went socially distanced door to door explaining the contest. And I can happily share both little boys were overjoyed when they learned they had won. Uh, thank you for listening. Thanks for sharing, ladies. I also wanted to mention that Skookum Lab has continued to support the community in other ways. In addition to everything previously mentioned, Skookum Lab has hired local Indigenous people to do the work. Indigenous students supported the evaluations. Indigenous nation leaders and elders were hired for various openings, prayers, and cultural supports. Indigenous mothers and families were hired to help support all of the work, like deliveries, workshops, and culture nights. The support Skookum Lab has offered the local Indigenous community extends far past just money offerings. Next slide. Ultimately, Skookum Lab has done a lot for the Indigenous community in Surrey. It has been a few good years of supporting the community and cultivating the information that they have. I personally feel like the biggest takeaway from the work is the reintroduction of the Indigenous worldview, the Indigenous way of connecting and creating community that benefits its society, reintroducing reciprocity, respect, and protocol into the work being done in the urban modern world has been a large task, but Skookum has taken it on with grace and gratitude. This has been monumental in developing the action plans for ad addressing child and youth Indigenous poverty in the city of Surrey. I feel like it also add, added to the strength and resilience of the community. And speaking to the strength and resilience, Skookum Lab has done a lot of work in staying connected and supporting community throughout the pandemic, which has exemplified the survival nature of our community and how culture ties into keeping our people healthy and happy. Thank you all for listening. Great, thank you so much everyone for sharing your experiences. It's truly been a blessing for <clears throat> us to work um, with the community as well. And, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. Um, one of the ways that we really try to decolonize our project is by um, building capacity. There's a huge capacity issue in Surrey in terms of um, offering services and, and having that supportive and vibrant community. So, um, through the ambassadors program we've now hired many of those ambassadors to start running skookum lab and now as we go into our next iteration um a lot of these community leaders will be taking on those um those roles and responsibilities so um i really love that mentorship model that you're you're using your gifts to um move up in the world and you know gain new work experiences as well um and uh, Dr. Uh, Dan Longboat, he mentioned something that I really like. Um, when we met last year, he said, uh, you know, our work is about gift actualization. And I feel that. I feel like this project has allowed me to come into my gifts and I try and support others to do the same. And it's been an incredibly meaningful experience. And now we have connections and relationships that are going to last a lifetime. So thank you all for listening and uh, we'll get back to Julia. Hi everybody. Uh, I wonder if you can see and hear me. Thank you so much, uh, Jessica, Ravina, Crystal, Melissa and Megan for a wonderful presentation. I could see the questions are flooding in. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of questions here. Um, and just to let everybody know, I know there was some curiosity. So we have 90 people here today. So hi, everybody that's joined us. And thank you all for being here. Um, just, uh, yeah, so I'm going to just get started with a couple of questions. Um, one question is from Maeve. So lots of people are sharing. It's a wonderful presentation. Is there a friendship center in your community or would you might want to start one? Um, they do many similar kinds of projects and are all over Canada, as you know, so help um, people feel really connected. So there is a friendship center in Surrey. Um, 
And they are only, they're one of four Indigenous organizations, and we have the largest Indigenous population in BC. So comparing that to Vancouver, who has a similar sized population, they have about 30 Indigenous orgs. So there's just a huge gap in um, the service providers. And prior to um, the Friendship Centre really um, getting going again, it was a lot of non-Indigenous agencies that held contracts that were meant for Indigenous folks. And so when the capacity started to come into the community, there was almost a lot of tension interorganizationally because of these dollars. And, you know, we had to really advocate for ourselves and say, we're not an industry, you know, we're not just about money here. It's like what we're trying to do for our community is much more um, intersectional than that. So it's been a very interesting journey and we are looking to bring in more Indigenous organizations to the region. Yeah, and I, I think um, what was really demonstrated in your presentation today was the level of community building that has taken place, which was really phenomenal to see that so many examples of that. Um, so yeah, lots of other questions. I wanna make sure I try to get to as many as I can. Um, one question from Reza was that, do you have any lab for job creation for Indigenous community? Sorry, is there a lab for job or creation? A job creation? That's a good question. So <clears throat> um, in the next iteration of Skookum Lab next year, we are partnering with a number of different programs. Um, but what we're doing with our leadership team is really trying to build up skills and abilities and gifts so people have um, more training to be able to go and do this important work. And, um, you know, for us, it's really taking the time to listen to what community wants and needs, how they want to be engaged with, what are the things they want to learn about, and then really co-creating it, right? So we really use a distributed leadership model where it, everybody kind of um, co-creates the programs together. And um, we aren't doing one just on jobs per se, but we are doing leadership training. Um, and then we are um, looking to partner too with a program that's run through uh, Community Futures. And they're more on the job creation side. Also, uh, Megan is an employment specialist um, in Surrey. So yes. with, for the indigenous population, so, um, do you want to tell them a little bit about your work too? Because that, because we have so many people with so many different gifts, um, we can act as connectors, right? So I can send someone to Megan or, you know. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I work with Access and we work on employment and training um, within the Indigenous community for the entire Lower Mainland. Um, so my work within the ambassador and the guide groups has definitely connected me to the Indigenous population and connects me to like what the community really needs in terms of job development and training um, to build that capacity to be able to move forward with careers. So yeah. Thanks for sharing um, Jessica and Megan and that's really um, neat to see. Yeah, the, obviously with the relationship building aspect, it just creates a whole different dynamic <laughs> with what you're doing. Um, I've got a question here from Sarah that's asking, it's an interesting question. Do you find, I guess when you're doing your, your research, um, is there a lot of diversity in, within the Indigenous community, I suppose, when there are perspectives on, on what you're asking? Or is there typically kind of more of a unified response? Maybe it depends on the issue. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah, definitely. Well, the community itself is quite diverse. There's a surprising uh, high percentage of folks from the plains out there, and uh, we don't know why that is, but people always joke that there's a Cree behind every tree out here. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, but we also have a lot of folks from West coastal nations, Northwest Coast, and then the land-based nations and Métis. Um, so in that respect, there is a lot of cultural diversity. However, for the research itself, I think that because we've developed such meaningful relationships, people have been so giving with their truth telling and that their answers are deep, meaningful, um, they're powerful. And <clears throat> I, I don't think that they are usually the same, mm -hmm. maybe on the same theme, 
Um, but yeah, it's just been really incredible to, to listen about. Uh, Ravina, you've done a number of the interviews, so I wanted to get your perspective on that. I definitely agree with Jessica that um, the answers are really personal and deep, um, but I think that's really due to our relationship with the community mm -hmm. and um, the, the friends that we've made and the connections that we've made. Um, Megan and Melissa and Crystal and myself, we were all community members and we didn't know each other before. And now we've become friends and, and you know, we, we do this work for Skookum Lab. And um, it's just a really beautiful thing to see the community coming together and then able to share that back with Skookum Lab and having Skookum Lab provide that reciprocity. And um, it's just amazing. <laughs> yeah, thanks, um, Ravina and, and Jessica. And I guess uh, I have a question from Joanne and again, fantastic presentation. Um, maybe she was asking, could you elaborate a little bit more on your research and maybe maybe one big research project you've recently completed or <laughs> something you're in involved in right now? Oh, hi, <laughs> adorable child. <laughs> Um, so like that slide I had up, um, we were only supposed to have three prototypes to address Indigenous child and youth poverty. But what we were, um, what the research was saying was that poverty isn't just about money. It's about a lot of different things for Indigenous people. Um, so we kind of came up with uh, the four C's, which is cash, connection to community, um, connection to family, and I'm forgetting the last one, sorry, <laughs> off the top of my head. It's always the way. I know, right? Um, so in that approach, we're, we've now taken kind of a multifaceted approach to addressing Indigenous child news poverty. And we, with those 11 prototypes, like we're unpacking pieces of it. So we're looking at poverty in relation to systemic racism, poverty in relation to the lack of housing and services, mm -hmm you know, poverty in relation to the invisibility that community feels in Surrey um, and the lack of connections that they have and natural networks of support. Um, a lot of families in Surrey have had ministry experience. So a lot of folks from the 60s scoop and then intergenerationally um, in ministry care. So, you know, we're looking at um, poverty and like those kind of systemic pieces as well. Um, and then our partnerships also, we just finished a miniature lab called Equity Lab at Surrey Schools that's examining um, systemic bias and equity for Indigenous mm -hmm. learners. And that was quite a deep project. Um, actually, most of the women here today helped on that as well. And uh, so we're kind of running more mini labs and then piloting programs through different agencies. But Skookum Lab itself is not a service delivery agency, so that's um, where it gets a little bit tricky. So we're, we're kind of looking at what that's going to move into in our next iteration um, as we keep the, the programs going. But we're really lucky because the Ministry of Children and Families and a few other sources have given us funding to continue the guide groups and to continue the ambassadors program. And to me, that's really important because, you know, the community has to get engaged with all the time and sometimes very inappropriately. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at these guide groups as a safe container um, where we can come together, build community, but we can also have our say and advocate on behalf of the community to the provincial ministries or the federal mm -hmm. government um, around the needs. And so it's kind of building that collective voice and then having um, a safe place for folks if they need to come in and do engagement, we kind of do the engagement for them. So that's kind of a new model we're trying as well. So like, you know, instead of helicoptering mm -hmm. in the community, getting what you need and taking it away, mm -hmm. you're actually, we're building capacity within the community to do those engagements th themselves in a safe way and then be compensated fairly. So there's a lot of different things going on. <laughs> yeah, no, there's a lot, everything seems very thoughtful and intentional and, you know, all these pieces seem to come together in this really beautiful way <laughs> um, and just you know, with the art and um, all, all of these pieces so so interesting and really um, 
if whenever you have research or if you want to share these findings with us, we'd love to kind of highlight them on our website. So please do continue to <laughs> stay in touch and yeah, on that. Yeah, I just put a link in the chat. So that's a link to all of our reports and our work to the state. Um, so there's a lot of information in there. Thanks so much. No, that's phenomenal <laughs> just to have some more examples of with uh, really well done community based research. So that's we're always looking to share <laughs> share that. So that's wonderful. Um, I'm going to keep going like we have a couple more minutes. Um, so one from Adrian, she was asking one of the challenges or barriers to research and reconciliation seems to be navigating who owns the information or knowledge. Um, can you please speak to this and highlight any advice for researchers and others interested in being allies with Indigenous people? No problem. So we use um, OCAP principles, um, which is ownership, control, access, and I can't remember the P. <laughs> It's always the, the last one. But if you look at the First Nations principles of OCAP um, and possession, the last one is possession or ownership. So we get really clear with all of our client, um, with all of the participants prior to doing any of the work. And we really take that time to, to understand what OCAP means and for participants to understand what's going to happen with their knowledge and their wisdom because it's sacred. And it's, it's something that we have a great responsibility for as researchers to care for in Indigenous protocols and in an Indigenous worldview. So um, we're very clear with how we are going to conduct the research, what exactly we're doing, what are all the steps. Um, we check back regularly and we also present our research to them. Mm -hmm. um, and then get feedback again. So did we get this right? Like, is this clear? Is your voice clear enough in this? Um, <clears throat> and then after that, uh, anybody can use our research. So any organization trying to advocate for more um, dollars, for more services, they now have some really nice um, packages of research to go out and do that work with. Um, and so we really have that spirit and that grassroots spirit at the core of everything that we do, um, that this is, we're doing this to change systems that um, have been oppressive and colonial policies that don't work for us. And we're advocating for our community for their needs now, you know, and we're going to be the squeaky wheel and it's working. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's really amazing. And I think the other thing you mentioned is kind of, there's a lot of aspects also that the, the kind of environment that's been created and that kind of contain, safe container <laughs> concept um, seems to be from like very effective and important uh, aspect too. Um, there's some, some more questions also coming up about um, the art. So um, one from Guy who's asking, are the beading and star blanket making sessions used intentionally as discussion groups that might take notes and collect data or are they guided sessions? I guess looking at them as possibly a research, <laughs> how they kind of um, embed with research possibly. Oh yes, definitely. So in the beginning, that was how we did our research. We went and we would have these three hour beating nights. We'd have tons of food. People would bring their kids and we just ask them a question, right? Ask them a question, we record it. And then that was pretty much it. And, uh, but now as we've moved to, into COVID, we will have dedicated research sessions. So people know what they're going into and they know what they're participating in. So we're doing two in February around indigenous health research in Surrey. That's oh, that's another lab we're running called Skookum Health. Um, that's with SFU, and um, so there'll be two dedicated three-hour sessions that will be quite information heavy. Um, but people still bead while they're doing it, and then other times we just have fun nights where we just come together and our kids get on. And actually, um, Crystal's daughter started a Zoom meeting for the children. <laughs> I love that. And so it's just so funny and cute how this is, uh, how it keeps like, um, you know, iterating. <laughs> yeah, and I guess like really 
uh, everything you're talking about is the kind of spirit of community-based research and obviously a lot of that started with indigenous ways of thinking about research but you know <laughs> with reciprocity and um but what it's obviously you have some good quality research and want to focus on that but also the community building aspect is you know so big and the action oriented aspect is so big and there's a lot of aspects there um i i have time for maybe a couple more questions but maybe even asking another one um there was another one about uh the ribbon skirt so what is the cultural meaning of a ribbon skirt as uh, info melissa do you want to take a stab at that <laughs> yeah so um from i guess each community is going to have their own sort of um idea of uh, the importance of the ribbon skirt. So I'm going to speak to mine a little bit. Again, I'm from uh, Kiniston Soto Nation in Saskatchewan. I am Ojibwe. Um, and my earliest memory of having a ribbon skirt was actually a ribbon dress. And it was during a rain dance. Uh, my grandmother made uh, my sister and I these ribbon dresses so that we could participate. Um, and the idea was uh, prayer. So you go and you pray and you, it's a ceremonial dress, um, only worn for ceremonies. Um, and there's some uh, dancing and singing and of course a lot of prayer. Um, so that's my earliest memory of a ribbon uh, dress. Um, men wore the ribbon uh, uh, shirts as well uh, for these ceremonies um, and a lot of it was really um, the print was prayed over so I remember going to um, uh, spots in my community back home where the prints were prayed over prior to making of the, uh, the uh, ceremonial wear so there was a lot of different protocols uh, in terms of um, wearing them and um, how they were made and the colors that were used um, and now, again, I moved here when I was 14 years old. So at that time, I really symbolically um, now think of it as like a severing of my cultural community. Um, because you, my, at the time, my mom did go to residential school. So in her mind, she needed to move her children into, I guess, a more modern world so that we could survive type thing. Um, but now looking back, um, it did sort of sever ties with my Indigenous community, uh, my culture, and now I'm, as an adult, as a mother, I'm realizing just how important that is now. So uh, being a part of Skookum Lab and being a part of the ribbon skirt making was an amazing um, experience, just personally, just connecting the, um, I guess, the past and, and the present and just realizing, you know, I made one for my daughter and she's able to dance and um, it was just a super uh, symbolic importance to me as well. Um, yeah, so that's like just a little bit of insight into the ribbon skirts. Thanks so much, Thanks. Megan. Yeah, go ahead. Um, oh, I just wanted to mention too that the ribbon skirts have become a symbol almost of um, Indigenous women's empowerment. And we see it across the nation, um, you know, when there's marches for the missing and murdered women um, mm -hmm. campaigns. Um, we see it, you know, at different, um, when people are doing land protection, you know, so it's become um, a real powerful symbol of women stepping back into their power and defending, um, defending our communities and de defending Mother Earth. So that's an excellent question because there is a lot of meaning behind it and um, a lot of layers to the that art and and other art that's taking place. Well, I, I want to um, just wrap up just about um, to share about next week really quickly um, and just thank everybody, all of our presenters here today. Again, um, Jessica, Ravina, Melissa, Crystal, and Megan for sharing all of your really amazing work at Scoopum Labs. I think all of us learned a lot today. I can see in the chat um, just how phenomenal what you're doing. And, you know, this is exactly what we love to see. And so um, please continue to join us next week. We're going to have an open discussion so all of you can.
can participate. And we'll be talking about uplifting Indigenous community wisdom. So more taking some of the big questions uh, our presenters have for you. And we'll have an opportunity to have a breakout group discussions on that. So if you want to join, you can um, sign up for at uh, communityresearchcanada.ca slash events. And just quickly after this uh, uh, ends, you'll have a quick survey that'll uh, pop up. So please, uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts if you take a minute. And again, Miigwech, thank you so much for wonderful presenters and for all of you for coming today.